happy and joyful 4th of July for you all as we celebrate the birth of our nation. I think it was uh, Lincoln, in fact, I know it was Lincoln, that talked about four score and seven years ago. Now it has been 12 score and five years. And the question still remains, will such a nation that was conceived at that point in time be still a land of freedom, and still a land that we love? And it is always a question from the beginning to the end. Indeed, is it going to stay? And the answer comes back is, yes, it will, if. If we, the people, make our stand and do that which is right and good. If we, the people, look to our God and see that his hand has been on us from the beginning to the end. This message that I have today, and it's out of Psalm 85, I did it uh, actually July 5th of last year, and I didn't realize it until I started working on it again. But this is a totally different message than was last year. A lot of things have happened since then. We were in the middle of COVID back then, and now we are now where we are, wherever that is. But we have an opportunity to transform this country by keeping it according to its original design, by men and women who are willing to sacrifice their lives in order to have free lives. The psalm that we have today is out of Psalm 80, verses 3 and 19 are both exactly the same. It says, O God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. If God shines his face upon this country, it will be saved. And if we are restored to that which we need to be, then indeed we shall be saved. Let's go to prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the celebration that we have. It's not often that we have the 4th of July on Sunday. Once every seven years is probably the average. But anyway, Father, we thank you that it is today. And that we have this opportunity to settle our mind and heart and soul to seek after you and to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, everything that we are. And to look to you to bring healing to this nation of ours. To bring the divide that has come upon us and unite us together again. We've seen, even in our short history as a nation, times when the nation has been divided but has been brought back together again. We ask for that again today, Lord, that we become those who are faithful, that are continually seeing you in everything that we do and say, and see your hand of mercy upon this country, and see the resources that you've given to us and the use of those resources to do good. Father, I do pray for this country. We all pray for this country that we remain good. And the only way that we can do it is if you do it in us, O oh Lord. Our eyes are upon you to restore us. Our hearts are towards you in order that we may love you and glorify you and honor you. And we are blessed, O oh God. Thank you for this country. Thank you for our faith in you. And thank you that we are able to have, even today, freedom of expression, freedom of of our religion, freedom to love you with all of our heart. Thank you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a prayer for a nation out of Psalm 85. Now, I understand when you're in the Old Testament when it talks about the nation, it's talking about the nation of Israel, a nation that has God's people in it. But even there, all the people were not of God. Not all the people that had the name of God were actually God's. We have the opportunity to understand that in our country. Though it has been founded on Christian principles, we have many that are saying, oh, no, it wasn't. All the founding fathers were deists or atheists or this or that and the other thing. They can say anything they want because nobody can go back and ask, were you or were you not? <laughs> they are safe in doing that. But we know from history that they were men of faith. And so 
when we come to this, we remember out of Second Chronicles 7, 13 through 14, it says, And if my people, who were called by my name, now that was speaking to the nation of Israel, but it is now no longer that way because Jesus has come and his name has gone throughout the world. And this can be taken by any country, whatever is upon the face of this earth that has God's people in it. The God's people in that place can claim this verse. And if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Here is the call that God gives to every one of us who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That we have an opportunity to bring healing to this land. Not that we heal it. It is God who heal it. But if we are the people that God has called us to be, then we are able to grab a hold of the truth and do something with it that is absolutely wondrous. We can bring healing to this land. It's amazing. We need to be audacious. Now, Psalm 85 may be a little premature for us in the sense that they had a long history of God in their lives. They saw God work miracles after miracle after miracle. They saw that they turned away from God over and over and over again. And then they saw that God healed them as they repented of their wicked ways and turned to him that healing came. And <laughs> how many times did the nation of Judah lose everything that they had by some invading king? only to have more wealth than they had before after they had turned to God. They had that history. We may be premature. We're only 245 years old as a country. But we have the same God. We have the same God. It depends on who we have faith in. In faith in Jesus, then victory is certain for us. I'm going to take the verse that we're going to center on all the way through this. It's actually the prayer. The rest of it fills in a lot of stuff. But the prayer is this. Will you not yourself revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I'm not going to... If you're looking on your, your uh, uh, outlines there, I have got here late last night and changed a whole lot of things around. So just hang in there with me. This, this verse comes on a little bit later. But I wanted to introduce this right now at this point in time so you can see where I'm heading. This is it. That God, if you will revive us again. How many times have they said this? Revive us, O oh God. Revive us, O oh God. Revive us, O oh God. Jeremiah, in chapter 15, God says, I'm tired of doing this. You keep coming back to me. Revive us. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you into captivity. We're not at that stage yet. They are not at that stage yet. God wants us revived. That's the reason why here's our prayer to revive us again, oh God. <laughs> you know, the thing is, I, I put that, that call to revival. I don't know how many months, weeks that we've been going with the call to revival. And I asked the group that sings for you every morning, the, the worship team, I asked, when, when do I need to stop doing that? And they said, when we have revival. Now's the time. If we, the people, pray this prayer, if you pray this today, if you start praying this, how long will it be before God will hear from heaven and revive us again? We already rejoice in him. But how much more would we rejoice as our brothers and sisters in Christ who are not walking with the Lord today will come back with a whole heart to God? It's happened in the past. I've talked about the revival of 1905 that happened in Wales. Wales was dead as it is today. And yet God broke through and transformed that country for a few years, very few short years. But how much would it be if the people stopped doing the stuff that it talks about later in this psalm of going back to folly after they've restored themselves with God? How would it be that we pray this prayer, Oh God, revive us again. Revive us again, oh God. Stir our hearts anew, oh Lord. 
and D. So when should this prayer be prayed? When should it be prayed? You need to start remembering. You need to start remembering your initial walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. You, those of you who have met Jesus Christ, you have a history of how he came into your life. It may have not been the time that you prayed to receive Christ or been baptized in Christ or whatever it is when you were younger. It may have been later when you finally realized God is real. I don't care what the story is. You have a story. Remember what the, uh, God has done. And what this psalm does, it starts remembering. It says, O oh Lord, you showed favor to your land. Look at our country. The favor that God has given to this country from the very beginning is amazing. I just read a, a, a series of seven books. It was, it's historical novel type stuff, so it's not a lot of it's not true, but it, it had the history, and the history part of it was true in there. And the United States of America should never have been born. It was human endeavor that made it so. They were against a country that had the best trained army in the world. They had resources. They had guns and cannons and ships, more ships than you could ever need. They were, they were the ruling, they were the up and coming world power. That is what Great Britain was at that time, England. And they should have been able to take on this ragtag army that during the winters, Many of the men didn't, they'd worn out their shoes and they were wearing rags around their feet. Barely surviving because they were not getting the food that they needed from the continental government. And they were starving. And they were de deserting left and right because they, they, they couldn't, they were, they were dying. But they stuck together, those who did. And in the springtime, those who left came back again. And then they were able to lose battle after battle after battle. <laughs> but never could they stop the Americans. They couldn't stop them. They'd lose the battle and go away and get stronger. That is not normal, and that is not natural. And then they conquered the capital. Now, they'd be used to fighting wars in, in uh, Europe where if you kept conquer the capital, you've won the war. That didn't happen. They just moved the capital to the other place and started all over again. God showed favor to this country. It was a difficult time. Did you realize that that war for independence lasted at least five years? That was a long time. And finally, that Yorktown occurred where they won that battle. And that pretty well sealed it. Europe, England was tired. The parliament was against the war. Finally, they, the king had to stop. He lost 7,000 men to captivity at that point in time, and they just quit. The peace treaty hadn't been signed yet, but the war was over at Yorktown. That's amazing. Amazing what God did. And then this fledgling country winds up back in war with England again in 1812. The most amazing battle that was fought was fought by Andrew Jackson down in New Orleans. And it was a totally wasted <laughs> army uh, action. But the United States of America sent those guys a pack. And remember the song? They were powdering the behinds of the gators and they, when they fired off the cannon... The gator cannon, the ca gator lost his mind. You remember that song? It was, it was actually fought after the peace treaty had already been signed. They didn't have internet back then. So they, they went ahead and fought the battle anyway. And the United States was established, solid. And here we are, 245 years later. God has certainly showed favor to our land. It is amazing. You restore the captivity of Jacob. Psalm verse 2, it says this. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. 
there's a lot of talk about how much this America of ours is wrong, how much wrong is in America. You know why there is wrong in America? It's because we're human. It's not because we're black. It's not because we're white. It's not because we're green. Well, we're not green. But nevertheless, it's not because of any color of our skin. It's not any of that. We all have red blood. We all come from the same father. We all is it. It's all there, but we are sinners. The reason why God continued to bless this country is not because we became righteous and holy. It is because he forgave us. The iniquity and the sin in our lives. He is the God who is able to do that because he is both just and the justifier. He is just as a God because he is always righteous and holy. You cannot stand before him in your sin. You will be a crispy critter if you do. It ain't going to happen. He is just. He'll always be just. So how do we stand before him? Because he sent his son to justify us. To make it so that we can stand before him. So that he can forgive us and cover all of our sin with the blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ who shed his blood for you. He who is righteous and holy and never knew any sin became sin and received in his own self the full wrath against our sin. That is the reason why this country can stand. And that is the reason why, even if we were defeated economically, defeated any other way, militarily, whatever way it may have been, we would still be able to turn around just like the nation of Israel and turn around and be blessed all over again and become better than what we were before because we have a God who forgives our sin if we would repent, if we would turn to him Revive us again, O oh God. You revive us. Amazing. You withdrew all your fury. You turned away from your burning anger. So we need to fall again before God and say, God, do this. Restore us, O oh God, of our salvation and cause your indignation toward us to cease. We need to call our nation to the place of saying, God, restore us in our faith and our trust. You hear our leaders in the past as we faced uncertain days, may it be whether World War I, World War II, or any other conference difficulty that we may have faced. Conflagration. There we go. That's the word, I guess, I think. Well, like, but any type of different situation, our leaders call upon God. Call upon God. They may not even know him as well as they ought to know him, but they know who they need to call upon. And that is our God. Restore us, leaders, that will call upon you freely, O God. And not be like some that are in the Congress now that says, don't bring God into this house. It has nothing to do with us. Or he has nothing to do with us. We will chart our own way. We will do our own thing. We do not need a God. Oh, yes, we do need God. We absolutely need him. Oh, Lord, cause your indignation against us. If you have something against this country, Father, we call upon you. Or we bring ourselves, we drag ourselves into your presence, oh God, that you may, and deeds restore us to the place where we need to be as the saints of the living God, believing in him every step of the way. Verse 5, it says, Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong, prolong your anger to all generations? And the answer is no. He's calling for us to do this verse 6 that I've already introduced you to. It says, Will you not yourself revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. <clears throat> there is a place of rejoicing. When you find that there is a God out there, a real God that loves you, that's amazing. I can remember it. 
One day, I was facing nothing. I was facing blackness and death. And I called upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord heard my cry. And he made me alive. The one who made me alive then could have said, oh, he'll just fall on his face in the future, and I'll just, why do we even need to start with him? Let him go to the darkness. But he didn't. And a lot of times I'll tell myself whenever I'm feeling like I might as well have gone to the darkness because my heart is not warm toward my God any longer. How did I get to this place where I feel so far away from my God? How did I do that when he did so much for me? How can I do that? And I know the enemy is right there saying, you are worthless. You are worthless. You are worthless. But what if God in his graciousness, save me knowing that I'm going to actually stand before him on the final day. Just like he did with you, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. On that day, when God has called the foolishness of this world to an end, and all the hurt and the damage and the horribleness of this that's going on in the hearts of men today are gone, we stand before God because he called us, he brought us out. So will he not revive us in the midst of all this so that we can get to that day with great joy and happiness? Shall we rejoice in him who is our life? Who needs this prayer? Oh my goodness, ministers need this prayer. Pray for your ministers. I don't mind criticism. Come to me with your criticism and tell me what I can do better, what I can do whatever. But pray for me, please. Pray for all the ministers. I still have my hair, so you guys must not be all that bad. It's all gray, but it's there. I need, ministers need your prayers. Revive that critter, God. He needs you. Revive him in his heart and his soul. Revive him. Elders and deacons need to be revived in their heart and soul. I was reading one commentator. He was talking about, he was going to a, company, a church that normally didn't have very many people in the service. But when he was there, it was just full of all these people. And he was wondering, why, what's going on? And he went back into a vestibule and, and he found these two guys standing there talking and just shooting the breeze. And he says, are you the deacons of the church? And they said, yes, we are. Why do you ask? And he didn't tell them. But he said, I knew the answer to my question. The leadership was not revived. Pray for our leaders. I praise God for the men that have gone forth to do the work of the deaconry and the, the elders of the church. But they need your prayer to keep going and keep going and keep going. They get tired too. Why is it that only pastors don't get burned out? The only way we cannot get burned out is because of your prayers. How can the leadership of the church not get burned out? It is only through the prayers of the saints. Also the workers of the church doing the work that they do over and over again. In our church, oh, I wish we had a church that we could split into two services that one, people could always go to a service, but no, we don't. And we've had people that have served your children faithfully year after year after year. We try to give them breaks. We try to do this. We try to do that. But there's no one to take their place. They need prayer. Revive them, O oh God. Revive them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. All the members of the church, you all, everybody, everybody out there in the world, you all need to be revived. Pray for one another that you may be revived by God, that we may be all stirred up. The hesitators, 
and the procrastinators, the hesitators, the ones that are, I, you know, I, I've been to church maybe, you know, five years ago and, and I almost made a decision for Jesus. I don't dare go back there because I might have to, you know, I might have to become a, a Christian. Pray for them. Oh God, revive them, restore them up that they may know that there is life in you and that there is a place of service that is glorious. The procrastinators that went, oh, well, I'll, I'll get to it someday. I've got to do this and this and this and this and this. Oh, Lord, revive them that they may know that setting off and putting off, serving our God is not a thing to be done. Because that's not where the rejoicing is and that's not where the love of God is. Do that. And then we need to be praying for our country. Oh, God, revive our country. Revive it. Restore it. Make us strong. Make us vital. Make us focus on you, O oh God. Let's stop our bickering and, and fussing about things that do not matter and find that our life is in Christ and only in Christ. He is the Savior of mankind. There is no other name given in heaven and earth that men may be saved other than Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. Oh God, our nation needs that message out there, and they need to be revived. Drawn. Drawn. How did those old preachers, the Methodists and Baptist preachers, back and riding on their horses, off into the wilderness, finding these people out there barely living and existing out there in the wilderness. Where'd they find the, the hearts that all of a sudden came alive and became the strength of this nation? Amazing stuff. You read the stories of Sergeant York, of Desmond, I forgot his last name, Das. Those men who stepped forward and did the things that they did, coming out of the roots of faith, of men and women who were just eking out an existence on a face of this earth, but they came to faith and they became the solid backbone of this country. Oh God, that you may restore us to such a faith now, O oh Lord goes on to say, show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Yes, Lord, pour forth your loving kindness upon the face of this earth. Let them see that there is a God in heaven that loves us so much that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. That God wants us to be everlastingly with him. He wants hordes and hordes and hordes of people. Hordes is not a good he has got bad and angry connotations, but lots and lots of people that are before him with faith and trust and vitality and enthusiasm for this God who sent his son to die for them. Grant us that salvation, O God. So the essence of that such a prayer as that is without a doubt a church cannot be revived unless God revives it. He's, he doesn't call upon, oh God, have us revive ourselves. You yourself, oh God, revive us. Bottom line, God, if you don't do it, it ain't going to get done. I do that every Sunday morning when I get up here to preach. I say, God, unless, unless you show up, it's going to be bad. But somehow he shows up, doesn't he? And sometimes I have to pray, God, I hope that somewhere between my mouth and those ears out there that you reinterpret what I said because I probably said something really stupid. And the internet comes back that way to me. They say, good John, when you said, I'm going, did I say that? Oh, I didn't think I said that. But okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. I don't understand it. But I do understand there's a God that wants you filled with his knowledge and the understanding of his word and that he will move you in your heart and souls. Psalm 85, 8 says this, I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. 
I believe that. That God will speak to you. That God does speak to you. Greatest honor I ever have is when somebody comes up and says that God used me in their life. I know sometimes they don't say it right, but that's what they mean. I give praise to God. That God could use such a person as I. But you know what? I'm no different than you. And you, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with great enthusiasm for the God who loved you, that you understand that his great love can be used in the lives of people around you as well. And you need to hear the voice of people coming to you and saying, thank you so much for what you said. Thank you so much for what you did for me. We've got people that serve this congregation that you don't ever see. We have this benevolence committee that meets, and they, they work hard to meet the needs of people. They're the unsung heroes of our congregation in the hearts and minds of a lot of people that we have served. We don't ever see them come back again. Very seldom ever see somebody come back again. We're not doing it in order to win people to this church. We're doing it to meet people's needs. And I thank you guys for doing that. We got people working on a house and grounds, usually just one poor guy. But anyway, thank you guys for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. We got ladies that do amazing things. We are, we are known for our funeral dinners. That's a bad thing to be known for. <laughs> but, but we are known for that. Because all the other churches have stopped doing that type of service to people. But we do it because we love people. And I thank you, ladies, for doing that. It's amazing. And I, I know it's dangerous for me to go into doing that type of a thing because there's so many other things that I, I could remember, but I don't have that type of brain. But this is what? I will hear what the Lord will say. Hear what he has to say. He will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. You are the godly ones he wants to speak to. And he will speak to your heart. I know there's a theology out there that says God had it written down in the scriptures. He no longer speaks. He does speak today. He does. Allow him to stir your heart. Allow him to do what he says. But, do not do, but let them not turn back to folly. That's what every time Israel turned back to God and God did his marvelous works and delivered them and blessed them exceedingly, they went back to their folly. Why in the world shall we go back to the garbage whenever we've been delivered into the glory? But that's what humans do. Let us not be human anymore. Let us be godly. Let us be saints. The net result, that your people rejoice in you. That's what the verse says. You, Lord, revive us, that your people may rejoice in you. The burden of the heart of the psalmist here is not so that we can be blessed, but rather that we may be a blessing to God. Therefore, God, you get the glory. That's what we want, God, is you to get the glory and that we get the salvation. It's a good relationship. It's a good relationship. Psalm 85, 9 says this, Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land, that we seek him out, that he may do the mighty works that he needs to do in our hearts and minds and souls. He gets the glory for it, but you know what he does? He lets us share in it. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's written above me, I think it says. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Even in this world, even in this time, and even in this land of ours, 
Wouldn't it be great for America to be known that is the land where you can see the glory of God written on the face of those who live there. They know that they're there by the grace of God. They know that they live by the grace of God. They know that they are servants of this God by the grace of God. And glory is written on their face. That neat? Amazing stuff. This is really cool too. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Righteousness and peace do not go well together in a world without God. God is righteous. And he wants us to all have peace. But if we do not have God, we will not have peace. For we will be staring down the face of the righteous God who exists in heaven. But God has given us a mediator. One who stands between an angry God and a stupid people. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we don't have to remain stupid. We can come back to God and have the peace of God that reigns in our heart. We have that peace of God through our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. Do you not know that? Romans chapter 5. Therefore we have peace with God through His grace. And they have kissed each other. In our faith in Jesus, it has kissed. It is glorious. Verse 11, truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. From the bottom to the top, everything is going well when the people have been revived by God. Indeed, the Lord will give, that, give what is good and our land will yield its produce. There, there's parts of our country now that are suffering greatly. In Montana, it hasn't rained for a long time. I remember a drought in the times past that a place called Malta, Montana, that the crop that they had up there yielded five bushels to an acre. It's going to be that bad this year, if not worse, over a larger period of place. Our God wants this place to be fruitful. God wants us to be fruitful. And here we go. A land that is revived, restored, Back to God is blessed. The crops will come in, the rain will come in. <laughs> Who knows, the stupid heat that is afflicting this country of ours in the Northwest will be abated. I learned that from a song, Rick, where Rick, 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 Rick is that back there. The song that he had for us. Is zeal abating? Is it disappearing? Is it falling apart? No. Our God is there. He will once again bring healing to this land and our land will be able to be fruitful. Remember the Dust Bowl years. You have to know that God was doing something, allowing something to be done. When you have Dust Bowl years starting at the exact time as the Depression at this, right before a major world war, God is doing something. And he raised up what is called the greatest generation. Those people were changed. Where this country was going in the roaring 20s was not good. And it changed. 1929, it started changing. God had something for this country to do yet. God still wanted to do a mighty work through this country. And I don't think God is finished yet with this country. Do you? So let us call out to God. Revive us again, O God. Revive us again. Verse 13. Righteousness will go before him and will make his footsteps into a way. A footsteps to the way. It's amazing, isn't it? I was up in Montana one time. I was cross-country skiing. The snow was about four feet deep that I was skiing on. <clears throat> Going along there, come to a Trench is what it was. It was about three feet wide and, 
it was down all the way to the ground. It was this trench right in front of me. Where in the world does trench come from? Out in the middle of the snow, did somebody get here their little shovel and shovel it out? No, what it was is I looked over and there was about 300 elk off under the bushes over, over the other direction. And what happened, I know what happened, is one bull elk said, I'm going over there and you guys follow. And he started going. And he made the first trek. And then the other elk followed in the same path until that whole thing became a trench that they were able to go through. We follow our God. He is forging the way. And if we will get our steps, our footsteps in his footsteps through whatever snows, whatever darkness, whatever difficulty there may be, we will be safe. Now, I was in my cross-country skiing. I had to cross over that to get to where I was going. <clears throat> Not easy to do. It was fluffy snow. I wound up up to here in snow because <laughs> I kept on trying to go up the hill and I kept sliding back. If I was in the trench, I wouldn't have any problems. Let us get out of the difficulty and get into where we need to be. Following after our God, calling upon him and praying, praying this prayer, oh God, oh God, do indeed do your work in us. It's amazing. Spurgeon had a prayer <clears throat> at the end of one of his, his sermons that I was going through that I thought was appropriate for us, that we pray this together today. He says... And you can do this in your own heart. Lord, revive us again. Lord, revive me. Would each one of us say amen to that partition? Lord, revive the pastor. Lord, revive the church officers. Lord, revive the workers. Lord, revive the members of this church. Lord, revive the backsliders. Lord, revive those who did not seem, do not seem to live but have grown careless. Lord, revive the church at large throughout the whole earth. Spirit of revival, come upon us now for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Father, I do thank you that we have the word of God that is before us. And we thank you that we have given us a country that has so many resources, so many blessings, so many historical events that have happened in the past that we can look back to men and women who have given their lives and done things, great things, for you. And we want to emulate that, O oh Lord. We want to follow in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Revive us again, O oh God. Revive this church. Revive your church throughout all this land, throughout all the lands. Let us make a clear statement to the world around us that there is a God in heaven and he has sent his son Jesus to us to save us from the darkness. Let us be that voice to the world around us. Let us do it here in this church, but let us do it in our neighborhoods. Let us do it in our workplaces. Let us do it where we may be vacationing, whatever when it happens. Oh Lord, let us be the people that are revived people. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.